Hey, Assemblies of God, Great Britain, we're so thrilled to have you here with us. We're about to watch a powerful message recorded at our National Conference 2023. But before we do that, why don't you head over to our website, aoggb.com, to find out more about what we're doing as a movement. We are in exciting times. To stay up to date with all of our content, subscribe to our channel, and we hope that you feel encouraged and inspired. Enjoy the message. to be here. We try to make this happen and then COVID happened. And uh, this is the first time I get to see you face to face. And uh, I bring greetings from the most locked down city in the world, Melbourne. Who would ever thought? Um, and But God is moving. You know, in our church in Melbourne, uh, in the last five weekends, we've had over 300 people give their lives to Christ. Um, pretty awesome. We love what Jesus is doing. Uh, it's pretty cool being here because really my family roots come out of Great Britain and, uh, and there's something about coming back to your family roots. Obviously my name's Evan so I'm Welsh heritage. Um, but I'll tell you a little story. I was a 16 year old punk bit like Derek is now and um, <laughs> and I was 16 my mum was praying for me she was interceding for me because I was showing worldly signs as a musician and these two British gentlemen came and stayed in our house and they were preaching for my dad who was the general superintendent of the assemblies of God in Australia, and uh, and I can remember, you know, there's people you remember in your life, and there's people you sort of remember. The sort of you remember people, you just smile and pretend you know them. But there are people who made a profound impact, and one of these men was a guy called David Shearman. And I remember him so well because he would talk to me, you know, pastors' kids. Many times people want to get to know your parents and so I would always test people whether they like me or they like my parents. And he came to me and he, and he, and he talked to me about God and what God wanted to do in my life and, and he actually gave me a, a track suit and there was a famous footballer that was in his church at the time at Not playing for Nottingham Forest and, uh, and he gave me his track suit. I can remember it to this day. And so I've had so many preachers come through our church and through our home. But when people go out of their way to value you as a person, to minister to you as a person, it makes an impact. And so I, I wanna honour you, David Shearman. Thank you for impacting my life as a 16 year old young man. So amazing. I also, I don't want to preach a whole sermon on honour, but I wrote a book on honour. It's a good one. It's not on your list, though. It is on there, is it? No, I didn't see it. I looked it up. Uh, I'm just joking. <laughs> you know, uh, I walked a long journey with, with Grant, with Grant, with Glenn. Uh, Grant, too. He was a good guy. Um, Glenn and Soph. Um, they started coming to Planet Shakers Conference. So, and uh, one of the things that I admired about them were their hunger to learn. They're always learners. They always want to increase. They always want to... I, I tease them sometimes because some of the ministries they get come and preach in their church, I'm like, why are you having them? He goes, oh, I want to get this bit out of it. And I'm going, oh, okay, good. Um, he, always increasing. And... I, I'm the uh, Vice President of Empower 21, which is the largest uh, global Empower, um, so, um, Holy Spirit empowered movement in the world, relational movement in the world. And Glenn serves on it as well. And I want you to know that this man and this woman are highly revered across the world. 
for their leadership, for their integrity, for their brilliance. And uh, they're some of the nicest, kindest, full of faith people I know. They're humble. They love you. And I walked through the journey on, because Glenn told me and he said, I feel God calling me to lead the Assemblies of God in Great Britain one day. But in the natural, it seemed impossible. In the natural. And so I, I would go, well, do you want to leave it? He goes, no, 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 I, I don't want to leave it. I just feel, I don't know what to do with this burden I have for it. And I remember the day he rang me and he says, you won't believe this. And so I actually believe that God has set this, this movement up to build on the shoulders and on the, the legacy of the past, but we don't live in the past, we honour the past, but we walk to our future. And I believe that this movement is set up for the greatest outpouring of the Spirit of God that you've ever seen. And this nation, as I'm talking about the United Kingdom, has had amazing moves. Amazing moves, such moves that have impacted my life. I wouldn't be here if we, the move of God hadn't come to this nation. Tommy Evans was a coal miner in Abercrombie. His future was coal mining, 17 years of age. Coal mining, parents were coal miners. That's what my future was. And another good movement called the Elam Movement. There's a guy called Stephen Jeffries preaching in a village down the road and a, and a miracle happened, a guy's sight, uh, he got his sight and, and it, 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 my grandfather heard about it and so he thought, I'll go check this out. As a coal miner addicted to cigarettes, sitting at the back of a meeting and in the middle of the service, Stephen Jeffries goes from his pulpit to the back of the meeting and says to my grandfather, young man, do you know Jesus? And he said, no, I don't. He said, would you like to know him? He said, yes, I would. And that moment, my history and my legacy changed because a minister of the gospel brought the power of the Holy Spirit. I grew up in church. I've been with the who's who and the Christian zoo. I've seen how the church, you know, goes through different seasons and, you know, so many pastors go to different conferences and they, they come and change their vision to their church depending on what conference they've been to. <laughs> Hebrews 8, 5 says, build according to the pattern shown to you on the mountain. You can't get your pattern from someone else. You can get an impartation, but you can't get your pattern. On the mountain represents the presence of God and and. and I, I believe that God's building His church and I believe that there's coming a hunger for His presence again and a hunger to, for dependence upon the Holy Spirit. It's amazing to me that how many churches have the theology of Pentecost but don't operate in it. I always say to pastors, whose meeting is it? Because there'd be times the Holy Spirit would be speaking to me in meetings and, and I'd have the, the schedule, I'd have it all sorted, I'd have it all ready to go. And, you know, I'd, I'd done my uh, practice for my sermon, I preached in the mirror and, 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 and we had it all out and it was all going. And, and then the Holy Spirit says, I want to heal people. And I go, but it's not in the list. It's not in the list. Yeah, but I'm the leader of this meeting, you're not. Because sometimes we tell God what to do in our meeting instead of say, what do you want to do? <laughs> so my grandfather, he got on fire for God. And in fact, in his older age, he used to go, I believe in the Holy Ghost and not much else. He went as a young man to India as a missionary. My grandma, at the same time in Adelaide, Australia, there was another guy from just down the road from Bradford, Smith Wigglesworth decided to attend Australia. And in Adelaide, over 100 years ago, or well just under 100 years ago, over 100 years ago, he did these meetings where healing was happening and God was moving and it was powerful. 
and my grandma, a little young, four foot nothing teenager, had an encounter with God and a whole family encountered God out of Bradford, England. And they started a small group. And that small group eventually became a church. Then a lady from America, because we can't forget the Americans. She came and her name was Amy Semple McPherson. And my grandma got baptised in the Holy Spirit. At the age of 18, my grandma, she would, she would get on a little box and she would preach and she would talk to people and say, come to Jesus. At, at 19, she would go into the hospital and she would say, is there any sick people here? They said, well, this is a hospital. She goes, no, I mean really sick people. Can I pray for them? They said, yes. I don't know if anyone got healed, but it would have been a good time. At the age of 21, she feels the call of God to go as a, an Assemblies of God missionary. The very first woman Assemblies of God missionary sent from Australia to India. So you've got this, uh, you've got this Welsh Assemblies of God missionary meets this Australian Assemblies of God missionary on a camp and they fall in love. They don't date, they write letters. They decide to get married. And so they get married and for the first five years in their ministry, they have two people get saved. Two people. They would come back on furlough to the, the Great Britain Assemblies of God conferences and they'd hear what's happening in Africa and, and they, they could have got discouraged because great moves of God was happening in Africa. But in where they were in India, they had five people in, in their church and only two got saved in that period of time and one of them had left. My grandma is, is ministering in the slums, in the rubbish dumps, and she gets sick and she gets hepatitis. Now she's there, she's dying in India. Back in Australia, no one knows that she's sick, but her sister has a word of knowledge and, and she begins to pray and begins to intercede for her sister and, and begins to say, God, do, what, do whatever you have to do. And she gets his word, there won't even be a mark left on her body. What does smallpox leave? It leaves marks. She's dying. My grandfather comes in. And, she, and he gets communion and he opens her mouth and, and he pours down the juice and, and he says, Look, Jesus, by your blood that was shed. And then gets the bread. And in the morning she's feeling a bit better, so he thinks to do it two nights in a row. And on the third day, the power of God comes upon her. And she gets completely healed. And she served God in Papua New, in India for the next 20 years. <laughs> Planted churches. All because of a move of the Spirit of God. Not because of organisation. Not because of coolness. I tell people all the time, Jesus spoke the language, so the church needs to speak the language. We need to understand Babylon. We need to understand the culture, but we need not to become the culture. When my mum was dying of cancer, my skinny jeans could do nothing. I needed more than being cool. I needed something more deeper than that. I, what I love about here is you come and you got that prayer meeting and it's packed out because when people pray, what happened to the Western church, we stopped praying. A church that pray, doesn't pray says they don't need God. My Bible says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and program, pray. I believe in programs, but programs are a vehicle for the power and the presence of God. They're not the leader, they're the servants. They, I'm giving you a little bit of our, my story. They leave India and come to Australia because they had a choice to live in Wales or Australia and <laughs> praise the Lord. 
And the, the missionary department of Australia said, people aren't sticking in the churches in, in Papua New Guinea. What's happening is whatever denomination comes to town, they offer them a better deal. And so they'll go to one church and then they'll go to another church because they might get some food at that church. or they, they get and that, So they would go, there would be a lot of church transfer and no one was sticking. And my grandfather, grandfather would believe powerfully in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So we went into the east region of Papua New Guinea and all of a sudden a move of God began to happen and people began to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and these uh, Papua New Guineans started speaking in tongues and they started sticking. They started becoming disciples. They weren't moving from church to church, place to place. They were now encountering God because I've discovered all over the world, doesn't matter what country you're from, doesn't matter what generation you're in, there is a, there is a hunger to encounter God. There's not an, a hunger to encounter religion. There's a hunger to encounter God. And they stayed there. And then my dad who went to Bible college, got married, and we, they went to live in Papua New Guinea, and I was born in Papua New Guinea. My mum got sick, and we had to come back, and then my dad took over a church of 150 people in Adelaide, and, uh, and it was in the first six months, went to 100. It was, a, it was church growth in reverse. But he got a hold of prayer and he got a hold of the Holy Spirit and he got a hold of faith and he got a hold of the Word of God and that church eventually grew to be the largest church in Australia and then, and then he became the general superintendent and, and it took the, the movement that we were a part of from around 100 churches with his great friend Phil Hills to, to be a, a movement over, over a thousand people in 20 years, a thousand churches in 20 years and they were planning church every two weeks. Because I, I actually do believe this, that God has raised up a man and a woman and, and, a, and a movement for such a time as this in this nation, in this area, in, in the United Kingdom, in Great Britain. I, I, I believe that in Scotland, the greatest move of God that we've ever seen will happen. I believe in Ireland. I believe in Wales. I, I, I believe in England. I, I believe. I believe it. And so many times we're looking for the formula to build our churches. You think about this. I've been around long enough. I know I look really young, but you know, I see people will forget our sermons, but they won't forget their encounters. If I was the devil, I would take encounter out of the church. And I'll just make it acceptable and cool and hip and, and just, a, yeah, it's a great place to hang out. I would make it where people, you see, the church was never created for the consumer. It was created for the disciple. Because you know what COVID taught us? Who's our disciples and who are the consumers? <laughs> and I've discovered you can't grow churches. Discipleship isn't a quick formula. Jesus spent three years with 12. We want to spend three minutes with two. Hmm. So I, now I'm third generation preacher. If you watch this, by the way, uh, this is what I believe prophetically is going to happen at this conference. Pastor Glenn touched on it, but I believe that sons and daughters that were birthed in ministry that may have run away or become prodigals. I believe there is a pulling of the Spirit. I can feel it in my very fiber. I, I, I feel it. I, I, I see sons and daughters who once tasted of the goodness of God, but got hurt in ministry or got hurt because a parent got hurt or saw something happen. I can see God bringing restoration and I can see people starting to step into a family, the family of God ministering together. So I'm third generation preacher. The problem is, the challenge within each generation is hunger. 
Because you know what God is attracted to? Not our coolness. Not our intellect. He's attracted to our hunger. Hunger attracts heaven. All through Scripture. Hunger. Jesus stops for a blind man shouting. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. What stopped him? Hunger. He's walking along and a little short guy gets up in a tree and something gets his attention up in the tree. It's hunger. A woman pushes her way through the crowd to touch the edge of his garment. And she's like, if only I could touch the edge of his garment. And all, everyone's touching him, but one person's touch got his attention. What was it? It's hunger. Hunger for what? The Holy Spirit. Because Jesus is there. I, I, I'm going away from my notes, but it's good. Because in Acts 2, it's the model for the church. Acts 2, the Holy Spirit comes. And in Acts 2, 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the eating of meals, and to prayer. If each church has those five things in it, the Holy Spirit, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. What's that? The vision and the doctrines of the church. They devoted themselves to fellowship. So I go a little bit deeper. I'm now not, not just there because I like the vision and the teaching. I'm now part of the teaching. I'm now in fellowship with the teaching. But then they ate meals together. What's that? Family. So we have an encounter with God. We have the vision. We have the Word. We come in fellowship with it. And now we are now family. We're a part of it. It's our vision, our church. It's not Pastor Glenn's movement. It's our movement. It's not my church. It's our church. And then they had intimacy and power. Prayer. And then Acts 2.43 happens. And what happens, and it says, great signs and wonders came amongst them because there was an awe. You see, we think signs and wonders create awe. No, awe creates signs and wonders. And hunger creates awe. I've been, in, I've been around for a long, long, long time. I've seen the who's who in the zoo. But the one thing, my, my grandfather is, is crazy. He used to come to our youth services at 87. He's a Welshman who loves Welsh hymns in the valleys. And he would come and he would come with his Ugg boots on. I don't know if you know what they are, but and he'd come there. And he wasn't cool. He became blind. So he thought, I'm going to learn Braille. I said, Grandpa, why do you want to learn Braille? He goes, because I want to read the Word. I said, have you heard of a CD? You can put that on and listen to it. It's called audio. He goes, no, no, I need to, I need to read the Word. He'd come to youth and I'd say, why are you come to youth? He goes, it's the hunger. He said, don't tell your dad, but this is the best service in the church. <laughs> you know what I did? I told my dad. When all those people were complaining about how loud the music was in church, I said, well, Grandpa said the best service. Rodney Hare Brown comes to our church and my grandpa's the first person in line to be prayed for. Benny Hinn comes, he's the first one. Someone else comes, he's the first one. He's hungry. See, the problem is in the third generation, the devil's smart. If he can take out the first generation, he generally doesn't get taken out. The second one gets challenged, but the third generation is what is the challenge to the enemy. Why? Because Abram had one son of the promise. Isaac had two. In the third generation, it was 12. If you can keep hunger from the first to the second to the third, the, the multiplication that happens through that place goes off the Richter. And the very thing that keeps generational blessing or generational moves of God is hunger and honour. We honour what was on our forefathers and we hunger for God ourselves. So I'm a, I'm a kid and this guy's preaching
And he says, who wants to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? I said, me, eight years of age. And I'm there. People think it's not seeker friendly. They don't read the Bible. The Bible says that the tongues is a sign to the unbeliever. Anyway, just it attracts seekers. <laughs> My church is 15,000 people. <laughs> I'm telling you, hunger for the Holy Spirit attracts seekers. Now, we don't have to be all weird about it. Because what happens is, this is what happens, is if we emphasize the manifestation, we stop emphasizing the manifesto. So what we've done in the past in our charismatic places, uh, and our charismatic places, um, is we've honor, uh, we honored a sign instead of the sun. So what happens is, you know, I remember when everyone was laughing. Well, not everyone was laughing. Some people weren't laughing. But, pe you know, people were laughing at one stage. And the people who weren't laughing were going, what was wrong with me? And some of the people who were laughing were going, what was wrong with them? Why? Because we magnified a sign instead of magnifying the sun. Just let God move. As soon as, as, soon as a sign attach, attracts attention to itself or to a person, it actually stops building faith. It does the opposite. So I think we can have contemporary church that speaks a language that can have power that doesn't have to be weird and crazy and God can move however He wants and we can do it with everyone being free. So I get baptized in the Holy Spirit. I'm 14, I'm becoming a naughty boy. And I remember going, God, are you real? And he says, what's that language you've got? I couldn't deny him, what's that language you've got? But my dad was a famous preacher. <laughs> I didn't wanna be a preacher because my grandpa was a preacher, my dad's a preacher, my uncle was a preacher, my grand other grandfather was a preacher, my mother's a preacher, my auntie's a preacher, my brother's a preacher, my cousin's a preacher. I didn't wanna be a preacher, I wanted to be a rock star. That's why we started Planet Shakers Music. Live out my dreams through. <laughs> my mom, she was scary. She was scary. I'm talking about hunger this morning. My mom, <laughs> uh, Pastor David knows my mom. She, we called her the walking concordance. She knew scripture like you wouldn't believe, but God would speak to her all the time about me. I'd be about to sin and she goes, Russell, God told me you're about to do that. Oh. I remember one time, I remember one time, sorry, Glenn, I'm not really giving them a lot of form here, but the, the, I remember one time I was in a horror movie. Now, I grew up, I wasn't allowed to go to movies at all, but a horror movie, that's really bad. So I'm in this movie and I'm feeling bad. And my mum's praying for me and she goes, and God speaks to her, Russell's at Tea Tree Plaza Cinema in Cinema Number 7. So I'm in the middle of this movie. I'm feeling guilty. And I hear, is Russell Evans here? <laughs> and I'm like, the producer of this movie is amazing. He has made Satan's voice sound like my mother's. Hmm. If I had a choice, who would minister to me? Because we had scripture all over our house, like really, scripture everywhere. In my bedroom, children obey your parents. In the lounge room, as for me and my house. In the toilet, fear not. We even had a stick this long. Spare the rod, spoil the child. On the other side, we need the every hour. And my mum, if it was a choice between my dad and my mum to minister to me, my dad every time. I remember one time I stayed away from school and my dad, I had to wait for my dad and he, he comes in, he's got this stick and he's crying. He's like, this is gonna hurt me more oh, than it's gonna hurt you. I said, dad, you give the stick, you bend over and let's see, it's okay. Says, 
Well, my mum, it should be different. She just grabbed, my redeemer, cha, 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 my redeemer, cha, cha, cha. She'd go through verse, chorus, second verse, chorus, bridge, back to the top. I'd go, mum, stop. She goes, oh, the glory of the Lord is here. She says to me, when I'm 14, when you're 15, God's gonna speak to you. I thought, whatever, but I didn't say it. I'm talking about hunger and encounter. Hungering for the Holy Spirit. I'm standing on the front row, 15 years of age, there's a cute girl in the second row and I'm looking at her. I'm like, thank you, Jesus. (laughs) She's amazing. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah the glory and the lifter of my head. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. He turned my morning into dancing. I get up, uh, the preacher gets up and he says, stand up, Russell. And I'm like, oh no. God's told him I've been worshipping the creation, not the creator. And he prophesies over me. Don't compare yourself with your father, your mother, your grandfather. God's called you to be a spokesman to nations. And you would have thought that I got all excited about it, but I had insecurity. So whatever voice you honour is what voice you empower. I had a voice of destiny, a voice of insecurity, and I, for two years, I honoured the voice of insecurity. Then I had a youth pastor, Danny Guglielmucci. He cries all the time. And if you cry, I feel sorry for you. And I remember one time we had a prophet coming and he says, you're coming to youth camp, Russell? And I said, yes. He goes, no, you're not. God told me you didn't want to come to camp because you didn't want another prophecy. Because when I got one when I was 15, I felt I couldn't do it. So I didn't want to have it again. And that camp, cut a long story short, I had an encounter with God that changed my life. I said, I said to God, God says, I want to use you. And I said, but God, I can't speak. I can't do this. And he said, who said that? I said, the devil. He says, I'll give you power. I said, what do you mean power? Acts 1.8 says, and you'll receive power. I didn't know that word mean ability, efficiency, and might. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you. See, when you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes and lives in you for you. But when you you get baptised in the Holy Spirit, He comes upon you for others. And from that moment, out of that encounter, my hunger continued to grow and grow and grow. I eventually became the youth pastor. We grew a youth ministry to a thousand people. Then we started Planet Shakers Conference, which grew to 30,000 people. And then we started music, which now is sung by billions of people around the world. And we started a church and it's the fastest growing church in Australian history. And I cannot take any credit for it because it's His ability on me. All I have to do is keep the hunger high. You see, in Leviticus, God started the fire. It was the priest's job to keep the fire burning. So when you give a God an opportunity to pour out His Spirit and you position yourself, you see, Acts chapter 2 wasn't a suddenly. They positioned themselves for a suddenly. Jesus says, I'm going away and I'm going to send somebody who represents me and He'll lead you to all truth and He'll fill you with power. He's not someone we just sing about. He's someone we invite. Welcome, Holy Spirit. I need you, Holy Spirit. I depend upon you, Holy Spirit. I need your anointing, Holy Spirit. I need your touch, Holy Spirit. Because if we're going to have a move, You can have a move of the flesh, you built Babel. Or you can have a move of the Spirit, which goes to places you you can't even dream or imagine. (laughs) See, I I begin to look at fires, not because I'm that way inclined, but fires need three components. Needs heat, 
needs oxygen and it needs fuel. <laughs> heat, oxygen, fuel. And firefighters are taught if you can take the heat out, the fire stops. If you can take the fuel out, the fire stops. If you can take the oxygen out, the fire stops. So in the big bushfires of Australia, sometimes they go ahead of the fire and they start another fire to burn up all the fuel. It's called back burning. So, so what happens is when the fire hits that place, there's nothing to burn. In Acts chapter 2, the fire of God fell on each one of them. Each one of them had an encounter with God, but there is something powerful and something really scary in the natural, but powerful in the spirit. Firefighters, one of their biggest fears is if fire fronts come together. Because if a fire front comes together, it becomes unstoppable. If a fire front comes and it joins together, it, it, it creates such a, an environment that it's impossible to stop. 120 individuals came together and the fire came on each one of them and their fires came together and they become unstoppable and the, it still hasn't stopped today. The fastest growing part of the church in the world is the Spirit empowered church and we are 700 million of us and growing. So every revival has stopped, not because God has stopped, because in the triangle of fire, there's the heat, there's the oxygen and the fuel. So God brings His heat, His power. God brings the oxygen, His breath. We bring the fuel, hunger. So every move of God hasn't stopped because God's power stopped and His breath has stopped. It stopped because people's hunger How do you have generational blessing? You keep the hunger in the generations. Let me just give you a little tip as a pastor's kid. Don't talk about your people in front of your kids. Remember my brother one day, he was about six and my parents were talking about someone in the church who had, was doing something wrong and my brother got out of the car and he says, I'm going to kill them. And they knew from that day on, let's not speak bad about people in front of our children. Let's protect them. Why? So that we can keep the hunger. <laughs> See, for a move of God to happen, we've got to keep that hunger. <laughs> Sometimes I get a little annoyed at God. I know none of you do. One thing God spoke to me this year, because... I really be, believe in humility. Humility is not, oh, I'm nobody, I'm nothing, I'm a worm. I'm from New Zealand. <laughs> That's not, someone from New Zealand just booed me. Well, you are the sixth state of Australia, so come and join. Uh, uh, yeah. You win rugby, well, that's one thing, good. Um, All Blacks, they are good, they are, they're my team. Because my son's Maori, so I can barrack for the All Blacks and still love Australia. Son-in-law's Maori. Um, humility isn't, you know what humility is? It's total dependence upon God. You can be strong and still be humi humble. The Bible says, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. See, Moses was called to be a deliverer. He just did it the wrong way the first two times. But when God says, set my people free, and then in Exodus 33, he says, take them to the promised land. And he says, I'm not going to leave here unless your presence goes with me. He's, he's learned now that he says, I can't do it in the flesh. I can't do it the other way. I can't do it according to how, so I got to be dependent upon you. I've got to keep my hunger. So this year I'm at my conference. It's called Show Me Your Glory. And the Holy Spirit speaks to me because I'm big on this. He just speaks to me little thoughts and I go, and I've learned over the years that if I obey, He moves. And He said, every time you preach now, I want you. Now, this isn't really what I love doing. He says, I want you to 
lay on your face on the floor and just say, you need me. And I would say, God, I have a bad back. We have four services on Sunday. You want me to do that every service? He says, yes, every service. I'm like, okay. I was in this Word of Faith church in America just recently and the pastor, he wasn't really worshipping much. And I'm like, they don't do this stuff here. And the Holy Spirit says, it's not by you, it's by me. So again, I humbled myself. What am I doing? I keep my hunger strong. Humility brings hunger. That meeting was awesome. The pastor said to me at the end of the, wow. I said, well, it's not me. But what happens is the devil tries to backburn our hunger through disappointment, through fear. Some people say, I got hurt, so I'm leaving the church. Try to be a pastor. We get hurt all the time. That's why I got to keep my heart soft. The only way I can keep it soft is in His presence. Unless your presence goes with me. I want a move of God, man. The great revival place of the world is represented by you. If we get hungry for him, then Glenn joins his hunger with Sophie's hunger, Simon's hunger, Kurt's hunger, I'm trying to remember everyone's name, Pastor David's hunger, and our fires come together. Because you know what they say about firestorms? They create their own weather patterns. And then what happens? is they create lightning strikes which start other fires. Do you know planet shakers? Our hunger created a weather pattern that created revival strikes in different parts of the earth that we had never been. I would turn up to places and they say, I got healed when we heard that song. Why? Because our fires come together. And it creates a weather pattern in the Spirit that cannot be stopped only if we lose our hunger. See, we want to see, and a great awe came upon them. We want to see everyone fed and we want to see all that happen, which is very important. We want to see souls saved daily. But they've got to go where it starts, through the Holy Spirit. And our hunger for Him. And He comes upon us. Hmm. Sure. He's here. We're going to sing something. And I don't know what we're going to sing, but I, I, just, I just feel for a moment, we just say, God, if, if I've lost my hunger, I'm sorry. If I've let something get in there, I repent. <laughs> if I haven't been... If I've been resisting you speaking to me about certain things, I'm sorry. Oh God, I want you. Everything. How can I be set? My kids now are fourth generation preachers. My daughter gets up and leads worship and it's wow, my, it's off the chart. How does that happen? That's not normal. It should be, but it's not. It just kept hunger.